Fullerton has done it. They've gone from 15 and 16, the champions of college baseball. Welcome to the 1,544 Miles to Omaha podcast, talking about the past, present, and future of Cal State Fullerton baseball. Here's a drive, deep right center. Back there, and Chamberlain has won it. A walk-off homer from the freshman Chamberlain, his first of the year. Cal State Fullerton has won the College World Series in 1995. One ball and one strike. Runners lead from second and third. The 1-1 chopped over the mound. The second baseman, Borgano's got it. Throws to first and no hitter for Colt Neesman. Here's your host, Dave Lamb. Welcome into episode 81 of the 1544 Miles to Omaha podcast. Uh, I'm Dave Lamb, founder of the Cal State Omaha podcast, or I'm sorry, the Cal State Omaha website and the 1544 Miles to Omaha podcast. Uh, Joining me as he does each week is the All-American pitcher, Mike Parisi. Uh, So, Mike, let's uh, let's just jump into it. Uh, Titans, they... They, they took a share of second place in the Big West, but by virtue of UC San Diego being ineligible to go to the postseason because they're currently still in transition from Division Two to Division uh, the Titans ended up getting the automatic qualifier as second place. They were tied by Northridge, but they had the tiebreaker over Cal State North Regionals and has broken the five-year of uh, no postseason. So what's your what's your thoughts? I mean, I'm a proud Titan. I think it's just unbelievable what these players have done, what the coaching staff has done, and it's only their second year in the program, and it, it, it's been remarkable. And the, the Jason has done a great job. Coach Deets has done a great job of having these kids, you know, play like the Titans did play in the past. You know, you're unselfish. You do whatever it takes. You're going to work hard. You're going to make all these sacrifices, and it has paid off this year, and it's awesome. Every Titan alumni I've spoken to is really happy. So this is kind of like – I mean, I don't want to make any unfair comparisons. I mean, so so please, those longtime Titan fans out there, don't, don't, don't kill me for this one. But for you, you were a freshman in 1992. The year prior – was Augie Garrido's first year back after taking the three years at Illinois. So this was kind of like his second year back in the program, and it was his first year of really kind of having his own players because the Titans missed the playoffs in 91. 92 was what started that 27-year run of, of consecutive playoff berths. Can you make any comparisons to this year being the second year in Coach Dietrich's tenure? to your first year in 1992 when the Titans went back to the playoffs for the first time after missing the, the year before, and it was the second year for Augie? I mean, I, I haven't thought about that, but that uh, looking back on that 92 team, me personally, I was just a young, dumb freshman trying to get playing time, and I had no clue, you know, really about the College World Series or regional I, I just, as the fall ball went on and as um, rankings started coming around, I'm like, this team's pretty good. And, hey, who's this third baseman that's National Player of the Year? And you have this Big West Pitcher of the Year and James Popoff. And it was a lot of seniors on that team. And I don't know if I could compare them, but, um, you know, it's uh, it's pretty special to, for just to be in a regional and obviously trying to win it. We were actually, we were actually the third seed at LSU in 1992. So Fullerton's the third seed this year. We were the third seed at LSU, and we won that regional. Yeah, on the road. So, uh, yes. well, what's what's your thoughts on Stanford? When when a lot of the prognosticators were were doing their projections, uh, we were originally scheduled to go to Baton Rouge, and then the next projection had the Titans going to Fayetteville, Arkansas, and then another projection had them going to Stanford, which is actually what came to fruition so it's the stanford regional and uh the four seed is san jose state 
the three seed is Texas A&M, and we can talk about them a little bit more in depth. And then I thought we're oh, no, the th- I thought we're the you're, three seed. You're absolutely, Texas A&M's a two. you're absolutely right. Two seed is Texas A&M, and three seed is the Titans. So uh, before we kind of start looking at the Stanford Regional as it pertains to the Titans, uh, what's your what's your opinion? A lot of there was a lot of chatter online where people were grousing and grumping about the fact that UC San Diego is ineligible for the postseason. I mean, they knew going in that it was going to be a four-year transition and uh, they would be ineligible going into this year. And, oh, yeah, by the way, uh, even if they win the, the conference next year, they're going to be ineligible as well. But there was a lot of, you know, there's a lot of grumping and grousing about the whole thing. Uh, and the comparison is, is that, you know, if you're a basketball guy, which you are, you remember the name Merrimack, who won their conference, but Fairleigh Dickinson, because Merrimack was still making the, the transition yeah. from Division One. Fairleigh yes. Dickinson gets the gets the automatic bid. They're the 16, and they ended up beating Purdue, and you know that was the whole March Madness deal. So the thing is, is that this isn't just indicative, or this isn't just just for baseball. It, it's across all sports. So any any kind of opinion about you know everybody complaining about the the uc san diego tritons not being eligible to to go to the postseason you know what first of all congratulations for ucsd and in, in being able to put 2023 big west conference champs i think it's amazing that coaching staff has done a great job recruiting and the program has come a long way unfortunately that's the rules you can't be really disappointed i felt like fullerton should have got in regardless you know so i'm glad they have the opportunity um, it seems like every year West Coast seems to get a little cheated. And, you know, you have Stanford hosting. I thought Oregon should have hosted. No one in Texas is hosting. And Irvine was – I didn't realize they were 8-1 against the Pac-12 and they had a 42 RPI. They didn't get in. And they were a great Big West Conference team. And USC definitely got screwed. So, no, there's not a lot of chatter about UCSD. They, they knew what, what happened. They can't feel bad. They had a great year. They should be proud. But uh, their time will come. Yeah, and I, I think that UC San Diego is a great addition to the Big West, especially with, unfortunately, you still have UC Riversides and UC Davis and, and Cal State Sam, uh, Bakersfield that's that's in the conference that kind of drags down that RPI, which obviously those are the, the three favorite letters that everybody was speaking about yesterday when the when the when the the, the tournament bracket was announced. But you know, it, UC San Diego is going to really help elevate the conference. Uh, unfortunately, they're just not going to be eligible to go to the playoffs for this year and next. But then 2025, they will. But um, I, I would agree with you that UC Irvine did kind of get the screw job in the fact that. Uh, they had a 40, I think it was 40, 43 or 45 or something right, like that. Right. And Troy had a 47 or a 48. I mean, I don't have the numbers exactly in front of me, but th- they had a worse RPI, but they were talking about how they didn't have enough top 50 wins and all this other kind of stuff. So it's just. What was, US, what was USC's RPI? I mean, probably in that range. I think he was, got five teams and USC didn't get in. Yeah, I think USC's was like 52. I'm not 100% sure on that number, but I think right. it was I think it was higher than UC Irvine's. So, you know, and then this and Kansas State has a real complaint too that uh, unfortunately they did not take in any any head-to-head competition and wins into factor. They just kind of factored in the RPI and teams like Oklahoma got in over Kansas State. Even Arizona, though, I didn't think Arizona should have got in. I know they yeah. had a good showing in the tournament, but SC beat them two out of three. So, I don't know. Um, I think Coach Stankovic has done a heck of a job in that program for dealing with what they've dealt with, but that, that's not our problem over at Fullerton. We got in, and uh, we have an opportunity, and I loved reading Coach Dietrich's quotes and how he's just so proud of his players and the way they've competed and bought in so quickly, and and if you know their program, I mean, they got rid of half their players. I mean, they have so many first-year players at Fullerton this year, don't they? They got a lot of new guys because, you know, they had to change some stuff. Right. And uh, I'll tell you this. I mean, talking about how Coach Dietrich deflected a lot of the praise when we were at Biggs yesterday for the the, the announcement, the, the selection show, uh, you know, the, the players started kind of rolling in. 
it was a little bit early for them. You could see a lot of guys with uh, wet hair straight out of the shower, <laughs> got out of the shower and went straight over there for breakfast. But uh, <laughs> Coach Dietrich got there and a lot of us were like, hey, coach, you know, way to go. Way, way to get us back to where we wanted to be. And he was like, no, nah, don't don't thank no. me. Thank them. And he pointed to the players saying hey, it was like. It's all them, man. You can thank those guys. It's it's, it's, it's got nothing to do with you me. You know what? But... Jason is uh, so professional, and he's been a pitchy, a great pitchy coach for 13 years under some amazing head coaches, and Coach Horn is one of them. And those all his head they give all the praise to the players. Like, he's just – which is awesome. He's very humble. You know, I, I guarantee you maybe if he's with his family, he's a little pumped up and, you know, taking a little credit, but – He'll never say it publicly. It's all about the players, and, and it's, it's well-deserved, and it's pretty awesome. And I also think that uh, it's, it's a testament to these players as well and the fact that you go down the roster, and unfortunately, just because COVID blew everything up in that 2020 season and you know, just based on the age of the players that are here, Zach Liu is the only player on that team from 2019, and that is the only player to have played for a team that finished above 500. And that was just one game above 500. I believe that that 19 season was 27 and, and 26. Didn't go to the playoffs. So this this entire team, it's the first time that they've ever gone to a postseason, and, and Zach Liu is now the only player that's been on two winning teams. It's Unfortunately, everybody else didn't. So this is the testament to the to the grind and, and to the to the dedication that the players to be able to come in and, and, and turn this program around. And I think uh, the total the total wins was 31. I think that it's like 31 and 22 was the was the final was the final record for regular season. So, you know, testament to those guys for actually finishing uh, what 10, you know, nine, 10 games above 500. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Great year. And you just go back to that first weekend against Stanford, and Fullerton should have beat them two out of three. Stanford could swing it, you know. And, you know, I think Fullerton's pitching staff gave a ton of home runs that weekend and that devastating one loss on Sunday. But it's ironic that we're back in Stanford and we're playing an SEC team, which we've had good luck against SEC teams or SEC teams in the past. Um, We're not going to be intimidated by them. We're not going to be afraid by them. And it's, 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 I, I like the regional. I also like the regional. So what's what's your thoughts on uh, San Jose State taking on Stanford and then, of course, a and uh, matched up with the Titans? So we were talking a little bit before, uh, before we started. Uh, something is a little bit of a twist here. So the number one seed or, or the, the, the host, the regional host gets to choose if they want to be game one or game two that day. Right. And the Titans are actually playing the Aggies in the 7 o'clock, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 o'clock Pacific game, which means the 5 o'clock Eastern, 2 p.m. game on Friday is the Titans and the Spartans, or not the Titans, I'm sorry, uh, Stanford and uh, San Jose State are are playing at 2 o'clock, you know, local time. Uh, That might be the fact that Stanford – wants to put San Jose State in that in that one dugout where it just faces the sun and it's just brutal. I took a look at the, at the I mean and that's that's a true home field advantage is when they right. put that that those visitors in that visitor dugout on the third base side and the sun just absolutely comes in and just roasts those guys. I mean there is no relief whatsoever. However, taking a look at the the, the weather, it's going to be low to mid 70s. So it's, it'll probably be sunny, but it's not going to be like 85 and the sun just beating down on that dugout. Right. Right. I mean, and let's be honest here. If you're Stanford, you're not throwing your ace game one against San Jose State. And, you know, your ace is going to go the second game against the winner of Fullerton and, and Texas A&M. Texas A&M, I don't think, throws their ace. I mean, do they have an ace? I know their pitching has been struggling a lot this year. Um so we'll see. I know they got to the SEC championship, but they had a battle this year. They, they struggled a lot this year, so it'll be interesting. So what, what's your what's your thoughts on Stanford deciding to go with the game one in the middle of the day rather than going at night? Is that the, the, the home field advantage of having the sun in the visitor's dugout? And then also 
your game will be done by, you know, uh, five o'clock, six o'clock or something like that before the Titans even take the field. So that just gives you even more rest, especially if you're in the winner's bracket. Yeah, I mean, maybe that sun dugout, maybe there's obviously a reason of home field advantage of why they'd want to play San Jose State first. I'm sure the second game, the winner of that's going to be playing a night game. I'd imagine game two. I don't know. Or do they keep it first game? Who knows? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, pretty, Stanford, I'm pretty confident that, you know, that's our regional to take and we just got to play good baseball. But it, it, it's there's three teams to me that can win it. Yeah. And I'm pretty confident that the 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 winners bracket game is slated to be the second game on Saturday. So uh, you know, win or lose, uh, I, I think Stanford, you know, they're going to be, you know, if they do beat San Jose, they'll be playing in that night game on Sunday, or I'm sorry, on on Saturday, just because when we were up there in 2018 during that, you know, the the shot heard the jumbo jack, the Jace Chamberlain home run yes. and ended up winning that in 2018 that was at the night game and that was the uh that was the the end of the that was that was the last game played on which obviously set the world on fire and set the titans up to to potentially win it the following you know the following day but um so your approach for if you were if you were the the coach Obviously, we're throwing. We, we got to throw Tyler Stoltz. I mean, it's it's not. Stoltz, a, Stoltz is pitching game one, one hundred percent. You're going out, yep. try to beat A and M, and you know, once you get there and you get in the winners bracket, you know you're going to do what you got to do. If I'm Stanford and I'm Texas A and M, whoever their aces are, I am not throwing them. There's no way, and you know, so that's that's how I look at it. So you got Stoltz going up against Stanford's number two, which probably maybe I'm guessing was the Saturday guy. You know, that faced them at Fullerton. I don't know. Um, so, I would have to do a little research on that. And, I, you know, I'll tell you what. Going back, just going back to Cal Poly Slow, and because I coach high school baseball and I coach against Los Altos, props to the walk-on recruit Eli Lopez, who tore it up this weekend at second base, filling in for Maddox Lotta. That was awesome to see. Yeah, I don't know if, I don't know if Maddox, uh, if his back issue made a, made a return up there at slow and that's the reason why Eli uh got got the starts up there but he he filled in admirably uh you know we definitely want to have both of those guys healthy you know you definitely want to have both Maddox and Eli at, at second base available but he did he did pretty well yeah he did he did so Florida did what they had to do they had a little slump they went two out of three they get to celebrate they're going to be a confident group going in and you know, if you're playing for Cal State Florida and you're wearing that uniform, you're not intimidated by anybody in the nation. So go out there and, you know, they're, they're going to get after it. So when it comes to the Saturday game, win or lose, winner's bracket, loser's bracket, you know, whatever whatever happens on Friday, you're, you're guaranteed to play on Saturday, no matter if it's, you know, game one or game two of, of the Saturday day. Um, would – would you move Evan Yates up to the Saturday or would you keep Peyton Jones? Because probably pretty confident that, that Finn Chester is not going to be pitching. Yeah, his arm, uh, something happened to his arm. I feel bad for him because he, he's, he's not had a good year. Yeah. So would, would you, would you move Evan up to. I, I think that's two? an option. And honestly, it's going to depend on who you play and what their strengths and weaknesses are offensively. I mean, I don't know. Is Stanford big hitters left-handers? Are they right-handers? I think they have a combination of both. Um, you know, I don't know. It depends. What about if for some reason they were to lose and they had to play San Jose State? You, maybe you save a Yates. You think of that, hey, we got to beat San Jose State and then try to beat somebody else. I don't know. It depends on who they play and what the lineup is. So as a, as a pitcher, let's say you're, you're, you're Peyton Jones or Evan Yates. Obviously, you've got to throw a bullpen in there somewhere if you're going to be expected to start on – you know, whichever day, uh, how do you prepare if it's one of those? Well, if we win and we face this team that's got heavy left-handers, it's going to be Jones. And if it's these the heavy right-handers, it's going to be Yates. I mean, how do you as a pitcher prepare for that? You know, sometimes in those games when you've never experienced pitching in a regional before, sometimes it's actually better if you don't know. I mean, I sort of go back to me in 92 
And I was the midweek starter going into regionals. And so I'm like, I guess I don't know if I'm pitching a relief. I had no clue what my role is. And all of a sudden they're, hey, Parisi, you're going to start against LSU at LSU, defending national champions, like out of the blue. So I didn't really have a lot of time to think about it. And it was, I remember there was a big rain delay and, and I threw five, five or six shutout innings and I got the W. So who knows? Maybe they just wait to tell the guy. Who knows? Yeah, that way he doesn't go to bed feeling all nervous and butterflies and all that kind of stuff. He's like, well, I mean, I don't pitching know if in a be- regional is a whole different ball game. I mean, I was very fortunate. I played on some great teams. I'm very proud of the postseason, but I started five postseason games in my career, and I was four and one with a no and a, a no decision. Actually, I take it back. I started six, and one you have to have a lot of talent behind you. You have to have great coaching, but it was. I mean. Those are so much fun to be a part of. So I hope you know they take full advantage of it and they trust in their ability. So let's let's talk a little bit more about uh, Cal Poly Slow. I mean, we're able to take two out of three up there and be able to get the automatic qualifier on Saturday, or I'm sorry, on on Friday because they moved it you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So didn't even have to worry about if the winner, the loss, or all that kind of stuff. But what about what about UC Santa Barbara? I mean, we knew that going into this this past weekend that we were going to need some help from UC Santa Barbara, but they got crushed on Thursday by Hawaii, and then by virtue of winning on Friday, the Titans didn't even need any help from UC Santa Barbara, and you know they were out, they got the automatic qualifier. But man, what about UC Santa Barbara just falling apart, getting swept on the rock by Hawaii, it's- and 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 just playing themselves out of the finals? Yeah, I mean, I actually liked watching Hawaii play, and, and we had a, a bunch of close games against them, and we were fortunate to win two out of three against Hawaii. Coach Hill, I think, is doing a good job over there. I've never played in Hawaii, but I hear it is a very tough place to play. Um, yeah, they uh, Hawaii took care of business. And if you look at the Big West Conference, I mean, you know, there's five or six teams that actually had really, really good years in that conference, and it could have gone either way. I mean, Northridge. You know, it was we got lucky to win two out of three there. I mean, if we didn't win two out of three, we might not be in. So it's uh, it was a good conference this year. You're right. Uh, with with Northridge, it came down to that series because that was the tiebreaker because Northridge won out at the end there and tied the Titans for second place. And had the Titans not had that tiebreaker over Northridge, it would be Northridge going to the Stanford or, or they would probably be shipped off who knows where, but – uh, right, it, it came down to that winning that winning that second game of that series that that ended up being the the deciding factor. Yeah, I mean, baseball gods were on Fullerton's side this year, which is awesome. Take full advantage of it because this game could be very brutal at times. And um, you know, I'm excited to see what happens. I'm excited to watch them on ESPN this weekend. Unfortunately, I wish I was going to be in Stanford with you because I would have gotten my car and drove 100 percent, especially my buddy whose kid plays at Texas A&M. But I'm going to be in Hawaii on Saturday to Tuesday, so I'll have to watch it from there. Right on. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll we'll be heading up. I mean, thankfully, the baseball gods or the tailgating gods, if you will, uh, smiled on us because we're going to drive up on early on Friday. That way we'll be able to get there probably like one or two o'clock in the afternoon and be able to do a proper tailgate prior to the 7 p.m. game. Uh, We were thinking that if we had to, if we were going to get the game one on Friday, we were going to have to probably leave on Thursday, stay overnight, and then be able to be there for the early game. But now we're able to leave on Friday and drive up. And so if anybody's listening and anybody's going to be going to Stanford, and they want to join the tailgate, obviously no host. So it's going to be BYOB, bring your own food. We can put whatever you bring on the grills. But uh, Dave Rodriguez and Hank Tran and Kirk San Roman and, and you know, a whole bunch of us are, are going to be up there. We'll, uh, we'll be properly tailgating. And so think of going to the Elk. It's called the El Camino Grove is the area on campus where the parking lot is right next to the uh, the, the the football stadium <clears throat> right directly across the street from Palo Alto High School. Oh. So that's uh, that's that's what that's the designated tailgated area that they're going to put us. I mean, I'm sure though the 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 picky out Chardonnay drinking Stanford fans are terribly too too happy about the Fullerton fans coming in and invading it. We're going to 
we're going to try to make that place look like um best comparison i could be, make is the the pool scene from uh caddyshack we're going to try to turn that uh sunken diamond into one of those types of type of raucous atmospheres and hopefully it's going to be one of those types of deals so uh we're going to have how, okay. how, how was bigs how was the crowd at bigs and how was the excitement when fullerton was announced it was it was it was cool. I, I we got there super early. We were I mean no shock. We were there. We were the first ones through the door. So a uh, little 8 a.m. Guinness for me uh, to kind of get the vocal cords lubricated up. But so we got there early. Grabbed the grabbed the table. Reserved it for a few people that were going to be joining us. And team got there probably around 8:30. Uh, selection show started at nine. So the team kind of filtered in around 8:30. But uh, there was there was a pretty good sized crowd by the time that the the players started coming in and all the players, I'm sure they carpooled over. And so when the players came in, uh, they kind of got a big round of applause and a lot of cheers from everybody that was already there waiting on them to get there. But uh, place was place was packed, standing room only by the time uh, the 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 show started at nine o'clock. And then I took a video as they were announcing the Stanford Regional, and so then they they announced uh, Fullerton as the three seed. And, you know, everybody kind of cheered and all that stuff. You can go to Cal State Omaha uh, Twitter and check, check out the, uh, the video that we shot. But it was uh, kind of one of the reactions when they got the reaction of uh, A&M being paired up with Fullerton in that regional. And, you know, some of it was surprise. Others were like, oh, hell yeah, let's go. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're playing an SEC team or something like that. So, uh, yeah, take a, take a look at Cal State Omaha on Twitter and scroll through the timeline and take a look at the video from the from the players reacting to the the announcement. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, go Titans! They do play on game two on Friday up at Stanford. They're playing the Texas A and M Aggies. So we'll see how they do. Wish them the best of luck. Hopefully they'll be playing on Saturday night in the winners bracket, and then hopefully they'll be able to take uh, uh, take another regional out there in Stanford and go on to the supers as well. So uh, thank you very much, everybody for listening and uh hopefully we'll see you next week with a regional victory in hand thanks for listening everybody thanks for listening to the 1544 miles to omaha podcast feel free to visit our website calstateomaha.com while there you can order an official cal state omaha t-shirt from the merch store Want to help others find this podcast? Please add a five-star review wherever you are listening. It really does help. The 1,544 Miles to Omaha podcast is an On the Lamb Enterprises production and is not affiliated with Cal State Fullerton or Titan Baseball.